Welcome to another episode from the Ed of Ed. In this episode, I'm going to be working on making a replica of a 1920s speaker horn. As of late, I've been starting to get into uh, 1920s uh, radio technology, and it's kind of fun is to just kind of glance through and look at old magazines of the era. Early 20s is especially interesting because uh, the technology is just starting to spring forth, and it's getting to the point where people common people can actually afford this stuff. You might have to build it yourself, which is in itself kind of fun because you get to look at all these components and everything. You can afford to eventually either build your own radio or um, buy a, one of the new commercially made radios such as the Westinghouse Areola and a set of headphones. The headphones alone, by the way, would have been a week's work. So uh, it looks cheap us to, to us today, but that was a lot of money. And then at some point, of course, you get tired of wearing those headphones and you want to listen to it as a loudspeaker. Well, a loudspeaker is quite a bit of money, and then the amplifier is even more money. So the thing I kept seeing was this ad, and at first I couldn't quite figure out what it was I was looking at. It took me a while. And it's basically a minimalist speaker horn concept where you already own the radio, you already own your headphones, you can't afford an amplifier and you can't afford a proper uh, speaker horn with the driver mechanism in it. But uh, you could afford perhaps this little uh, minimalist speaker horn where you then take your headphones and you plug them into each side of these uh, ports here and hopefully you'll get some acoustic amplification kind of like you do with a phonograph. And you know, below here is by the way another ad for another attachment that would take your um, headphones and attach them to your uh, existing uh, phonograph and hopefully get some amplification from that. So the idea was back then, you know, you didn't have a lot of money, things were pretty new. As it was, even if you could afford an amplifier, getting the vacuum tubes at the time, there was this big craze for uh, radio and vacuum tubes at times were uh, quite uh, hard to come by. There was actually a shortage of vacuum tubes and, you know, you might buy a vacuum tube and it was actually a, a bootleg vacuum tube and it might not have been any good. So anyhow, the thought was, well this is fairly minimalist a little project here. I could probably design and 3D print a, a, a replica of this guy and see if it works. So that's kind of the genesis of this next project is can I make a, a working replica, use my headphones which I've got uh, tuned up a bit more and uh, see what it would have been like in the 1922 um, for these folks you know, could they have gotten really nice amplification? Could it have filled the room? How well it would it have worked? It's interesting. I've seen a number of these different products in the magazines from about 1922 to about 1924. They seem to disappear about 1924. And I think the reality is by then, people were able to more readily get amplifiers that were more refined at that time. Speakers were getting more refined, a little bit more reasonably priced. Proportionally, this is kind of expensive what you get. It, it was a really nice um, de a product as far as it was a nice casting. It's polished and looks very nice. There were cheaper versions for about a half or even a quarter of that. And in fact, uh, at the end of some of the magazines, there's actually some subscription drives for the really cheap ones where if you got so many uh, people to subscribe to the magazine, they'd give you one of these um, uh, headphone um, speaker uh, adapters. So... Anyhow, it seemed like a neat, fun project, so I modeled up a kind of a rough equivalent of and um, want to 3D print this guy and see how it works. Okay, here's my speaker horn all assembled, and I thought I would um, show it to you folks, especially for the folks that. Uh, or only just kind of wanting to look at this video really quick and just kind of curious as to what this was about and are not really too interested in the, the details or the nitty gritty of actually building this thing but might be interested to see how it performs so um, I'll give you a quick demo of that and then uh, later on I'll um, of course continue on with this video on all the extra little features and so forth and uh, of this speaker horn project if you care to 3D print and possibly go as far as even sanding and painting and so forth like I did on this guy. And uh, otherwise, you know, check out how it runs. And if you're interested, maybe build one. 
Hey, so I thought I'd show you my uh, 1920s, early 20s model speaker horn here, all finished and ready to go, uh, before going into the actual build for the folks that might not be interested in following the actual build and construction and possibly building their own, but are still interested in uh, how this thing performs and so forth. So here it is with um, uh, the, my 1920s headset slightly coupled in. I don't, I'm not using the extra clamping features. And I have it hooked up to the output of the headphone jack of the laptop set at highest volume. So obviously if you're wearing these, it'd be a bit uncomfortably loud. But the idea here is, of course, you want to share your music with uh, folks. But at the same time, you can't afford uh, the latest amplifiers and proper speaker horns. You know, those alone would be the cost of what you just laid out for the radio uh, which, you know, you probably just could barely afford at the wages of the day. And the headphones themselves are a, a good week's wage. And so, you know, you get tired of wearing the headphones. You obviously have to share them with your family. There's this novel thing called radio. And you want to sit in your hopefully quiet room and listen to music together. So this is what it's like in 1922, 24. Obviously, it's not going to knock your socks off, but, uh, you know, I can walk to the far end of this room, a good ten feet away, and hear it just fine. Uh, I, I, the thing I can't emphasize probably enough is that the microphone just doesn't do it justice. It sounds so much better in person without any sort of, like, special tweakings or something like that. I'm not sure how I could, uh, you know, present this any better than this. Um, obviously, the the thing to do would be to make one yourself and experience it, see what it's like. Obviously it does amplify some. Yeah, not that spectacular, but still. For the outlay, this is basically what a quarter or so of what you would have had to pay the amplifier cost about the cost of your radio and the proper speaker horn with um, you know its own driver would cost about as much as uh, your amplifier also and you know at the time there was a big rush into radio and things like vacuum tubes were in short supply so you'd buy this stuff and might not even be able to get vacuum tubes And it's not clamped in there ideally. I could probably get a little bit of performance by clamping it with the little clamping features I have here. Which are probably not really necessary. And then later on I'll do a demo with uh, modern headphones and you'll uh, you'll find that they uh, they sit on there very easily. So anyhow, for folks that want to continue on this video, I'll show you uh, how to assemble and make this thing happen and for folks that uh, just simply wanted to check it out and see what it was like in early 20s here it is Like I say, uh, the microphone just doesn't do it justice. It sounds so much better in person. So the folks that are interested in maybe the build project, thanks for watching. And for the folks that are interested in the build project, let's get on with uh, a lot of 
assembly sand and painting, and I think it's well worth it though. It's a lot of fun and it's a nice display piece. And you know, it's something to add to your collection. So after uh, 10, 13 hours of running, this is what I wound up with. It looks beautiful up till about this level, and then it turns to kind of a foam. Unfortunately, the nozzle started to plug, and it was very much under extruding, which is kind of fascinating. I've never, all the time I've been 3D printing, I've never had this happen before. Uh, it's kind of cool. So, uh, being I'm going to paint these after all, uh, I originally thought, well, it kind of looks like, you know, bronze. I was thinking I'd glue all these sections together and just call it, you know, a bronze casting, rather than the original um, model um, heads, um, headphone speaker design I'm kind of modeling this very vaguely after, which was aluminum with some uh, nickel-plated steel and so forth. Um, I guess I, I'm still not sure what I'm going to paint these to, but it, it pro I guess it's not going to be bronze. But anyhow, 3D printed another one, and being that it is going to be um, painted, I decided to uh, go ahead and um, print it out of clear plastic. This is actually um, PLA without just any pigment. So this is just what it would naturally look like. And I don't know if it will pick up in the camera or not to be able to see the duct ducting inside. It'd be, I just thought it would be kind of neat to be able to, to see the ducting in this guy. Uh, I can obviously show it to you in the... Um, in the uh, CAD software. Uh, it's, it'd probably never pick up as well as you can see it in person. You can kind of see it there a little bit. And as you can see all the little um, grid framework that's in there that's from the printing. Uh, probably can't pick it up. But anyhow, it's a really nice you know, ducting that uh, you know expands over time to the next you know, horn section, so basically we wind up with is you know, um horn section like so, it'll just sit in there like that and then um, glue the next guy on and then glue the next guy on and then ta -da, we have a uh, kind of a 1920s looking horn set that then I'll paint. Hopefully look somewhat convincingly like a real McCoy. And then I'll be able to see whether or not my headsets can really drive any sort of usable sound out of something like this. I, you look at these ads in these old uh, early 20s uh, radio magazines and there seems to be, I, I still keep thinking it's optimistic but maybe it'll work. I mean the whole idea is, is you're not uh, getting something for nothing. This is basically a um, an impedance matching device is basically what a horn uh, cone speaker is a uh, exponential uh, uh, expanding cone so uh, if you can shepherd and organize the pressure wave of the sound just right you can actually get the most out of your you know meager amount of energy and you know deliver it to a, a usable um, space where people can hear it hopefully at least that's the thought so uh, next thing is obviously to start sanding and 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 maybe I'll put some of this uh, two-part uh, thin epoxy material on and sand them and glue them all together and paint them and so forth and and then <laughs> see if my headsets can actually uh, drive a kind of a loudspeaker we'll see if it works or not it, at least it's a fun project anyways we well, got to learn some you know really complicated uh, geometries here that I had I thought I was doing complicated stuff before but this is probably one of the more difficult ones you know and it's um, it was like 13 hours for this guy and that's 13 hours of printing for this guy you know four hours for this and five hours for that so already a lot of processing time but it's kind of handy you know you just start the thing overnight and go to bed and the next morning ta-da you have something uh, on the uh, well, uh, for all practical purposes a magic tr platform things appear so anyhow, off we go to the next step of this thing, which is going to be the fun part of gluing and sanding and painting and so forth. Okay, so I got all the 3D printed parts done, you know, the outermost horn. Obviously the limitation was ultimately this guy, he's the biggest guy, as much as I could fit on my bed of my printer. 
And there's kind of a neck. I had to break it up into three parts. It was uh, able to fit in for the cone the horn section, and of course the main section where the ear pieces actually stick together and they manifold together. So this guy has a, a nice little shoulder in it for this guy to sit in, and uh, I had toyed with the idea of um, designing them with um, shoulders uh, features on these two, but uh, that would have made the wall thickness even thicker. So taking the gamble of butt gluing these together, and uh, the biggest thing there then is making certain that all those surfaces are um, flush and true, uh, as flat as possible. When this guy is 3D printing, it's doing it multiple layers, and so this particular uh, print came out very fine because I had it set to a very fine level, but you can still see if you look very carefully that there's little fine steps involved there. So that plane wouldn't be quite as flush and smooth as I would like to glue up against this guy. So I want the glue bonding uh, to be as uh, uh, you know as tight as possible. So the idea here is I got some fairly fine sandpaper, uh, 320 grit is probably good enough. And I'm just going to very lightly on a flat surface here. This is a fairly flat surface. Um, sand this guy down to where it um, comes out flat. And it doesn't take much because it's uh, this is just PLA plastic and it won't uh, work too much. So I'll do these guys, uh, sand these surfaces and so forth, and when I come back, uh, I'll go from there. Obviously, you don't need to see me sanding this stuff because it's uh, really exciting, isn't it? Okay, so lots of sanding later. I think I got these guys pretty, pretty flush here. The next biggest thing, of course, is to get all that dust off. Uh, compressed air, if you got it, would be really nice. And then the next thing to kind of, I'm kind of wondering about is which way to do this. Well, I was like, I glue this guy on first, and then glue him on, and then glue this guy on. But it's going to be kind of a challenge to, get, to somehow clamp that. I don't know how I'm going to clamp this guy, realistically. So I might be better off maybe clamping and gluing these together first. Then perhaps clamping and gluing this guy together. And then finally dropping it in there, because that's going to be the easiest. I think that's probably... I, originally I was just going to stack it up this way, but... More I think about it when it comes to time to actually do this thing, that's going to be the easiest thing to glue last because I got a shoulder there. So I think I'm going to put him off to one side then, and then struggle with this because this is this is the side that's going to be a, a kind of a bear to get to to line up right. I guess I can it'll twist around quite a bit, and it, obviously there's an elliptical pattern to this, and you can probably eyeball it pretty well. But there's going to be definitely a lot of error there, so I got to figure out how to clamp that and or clamp this guy. And I think probably however I clamp this maybe just tape is going to have to be done regardless so I think and once again more that it probably make the most sense to glue these together first because this I think I can compress and hold them together into compression without too much trouble with a, a, a um, clamp. This guy it's quite a mystery how I'm going to do it. And when I was designing this guy, it was, it was one of those things in the back of your mind. It's like, how are we really going to do that? It's almost static enough you can actually do it with just its weight. Obviously, you need more than that. Maybe some good duct tape will, will hold it in. And then, of course, the glue will ooze over the edges, and I'll have to do a lot of sanding afterwards. So that's totally expected. The advantage to do it this way also is the fact that if I do any glue ooze, I can get in there and sand. So I think that's... I'm arguing myself into that, so I think that's what I'm going to do. One advantage of doing these YouTube videos is you have to kind of plan ahead of time. Whereas uh, if you um, don't have an audience to try and plan this out for and uh, worry about making a mistake, um, you can just go at it and make that mistake without any further pre-planning. So another advantage to you know, showing this stuff to you, I think. So I do appreciate you folks watching this stuff. Well, I've settled on a technique here. I got, luckily, at a uh, grunt sale a few years ago, this really nice long uh, clamp. It's kind of long, <laughs> if you notice, but it will definitely serve the job if, as long as they don't clobber anything in the shop here uh, because of the sheer length. And uh, it just, it's one of those nice little devices that uh, 
releases and you can adjust this. So I think this will work. And I might have to put a little dab of tape over here to keep it from springing out. But I think this will work. So I'm just about ready to try and glue this guy. Okay, sanding and all good stuff. I'm um, about ready to clean my surfaces. And uh, the nice thing about this particular uh, glue that I use is Gorilla Glue. I don't know if it's really all that particularly great. Uh, with a name like Gorilla, it's got to be pretty strong, right? Um, it's the fact that it's a water activated um, uh, adhesive. So it has the advantage that I can then get that last little bit of dust off by having to clean it a little bit with some water in effect. So the biggest thing is to make certain I don't have any lint from the parts. And then the other thing about this stuff is it does expand quite a bit. So use as little as you can get away with and try and not get the uh, glue itself um, wet. The little surface here. So I try and I can put as little as I can. I only put in about one quarter or half of the um, circumference there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist these together. Try and distribute that adhesive evenly. And there's a little flaw I noticed in my 3D print that's back here. I'm going to put it back there. The biggest thing is I've got to get this all aligned nicely. And luckily this conical section right at this point is a simple, uh, is indeed a simple symmetrical conical section, so it's not really a, a problem as far as um, getting your um, axial alignment with the uh, conical section. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compress it, and I'm going to look for um, any sort of odd bowing there, see if, I can, if it really is truly in there. The only, my only complaint is I wish this uh, clamp would have a little more force to it. It doesn't seem like it puts a lot of force on it. It may have been the reason the guy sold it. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be particularly aggressive. Hopefully it'll be enough. It seems pretty firm there. Okay. And it makes it doesn't want to slip here. And of course these gloves are getting all kinds of glue on them, which is no big deal. And basically I'll, I'll do is I'll probably get in here with my fingers and try and wipe that little excess out. There's a lot of sanding involved later on anyways. And the biggest thing is by doing it this way I can avoid um, being not able to access that air. And I want to keep, obviously, the, the surface is smooth so I don't have a, a ripple in there that'll disturb the airflow. So, let that uh, sit for however long they advise on this. I think it's a fairly quick, I think it's a 30 to 60 minutes. Alrighty. Okay, it's been a full day later, and now we can take this guy off and see how it's held up. And it looks like I don't really even need to terribly worry about sanding the inside. It's still pretty smooth in there. I don't see if the glue oozed out much. Without obviously putting a whole lot of force on it, it seems to be pretty solid. So the next question mark is how to glue this guy. And I think take this thing out without it clobbering things. It's super long. I think the thing here will be. I have to make certain that the alignment is right because there's it, it, it's, it's two elliptical sections. So while I'm fiddling around with this thing, I gotta make certain that I get it the right spot. So I think what I'll do is maybe off camera here I'll ponder on the exact location and I'll mark it with some felt tip pin a couple points and then I'll make certain that when I glue it on I make certain that that's rotated to those points where I determined earlier it was good and then hold it there. And then the next question is still is how am I gonna <laughs> How do you clamp something that's uh, all these compound curves and everything? There's just there's no way to really put a, a proper compression on it, so I may just have to settle for um, duct tape, which is not ideal. But I don't know what else I can really do realistically. 
mold is over some. Okay, so I've determined my uh, uh, axis of alignment. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, marks all about various points. And I've got a whole bunch of very aggressive uh, Gorilla brand tape. It seems like I seem to be doing a lot of Gorilla stuff. No real endorsement, just happened to be what I happen to have. And it's water activated once again, so I will moisturize without getting it too wet these uh, surfaces. And this uh, plastic is fairly porous, so I would think it would, uh, you know, trap a little bit of water in there. And it's, um, um, you know, a nice way of cleaning the surface off. And then once again, I'm going to put on only a, the minimum necessary because uh, this stuff does expand quite a bit and so I will uh, put a little bit here now without getting the glue itself wet with water that might obviously um, catalyze cause the stuff to react in the bottle and the next thing here is to kind of rotate this guy around until I get all that glue evenly applied And then the fun part begins, and that is getting this all aligned here and with wet gloves. Mm. It's not going to help the uh, tape any. I better go grab my gloves off. Put as much tension on it as I can. I'll grab my gloves off. This guy as much as I can. We're going to tape. Okay, so I'm going to try and do opposing sides here. I've got a problem with this guy because it's, it's going on. I need for attention. Naturally, I'm going to have to have a lot of fun with getting this tape off with it being glued in place and everything else, I'm sure. Um, but I don't know any other way of doing this. If you folks have any ideas, leave comments in the, uh, you know, the comment section. It's always handy to have folks various ideas. Can't guarantee you jump on them, but always a thought. A little bit of a courtesy uh, point, so I can pull on that tape easier later. Later on, see here so far, we're looking pretty good. I think we're still in pretty good alignment. Good as I can hope for. And I guess I can do the final gauging the alignment from the other side because I'm thinking of putting tape along the whole perimeter of this guy to kind of lock it in place. This could make for quite a fun bit of mess trying to clean it all off. So far we're looking pretty good. And of course, this this adhesive uh, expands, so that's kind of a kind of a problem in itself, is it will expand and try and push the parts apart a little bit. So now I'm wishing I had made it more tape strips.
so far so far. resin to this guy and then sand it down make it look a little less like a uh, 3d printed part smooth out a bunch of this you know 3d printing texture and so forth guess while this is expanding I might as well smear the glue around the inside and judge that it's not shifted too much at least from the inside because I can't I now can't see the outside with all the tape and I, you know, I wouldn't be all surprised I'll have a little bit of discontinuity, discontinuity in the joint, but I guess I'll just sit here and, and observe this while it hardens a bit more, so that's kind of it. I'll fuss with it more off camera and hope for the best. Okay, so this guy's been sitting for a half hour to 45 minutes. It's probably solid enough to mess about with and not worry about it too much. So I think what I'm going to do next is try and glit the base glued on. It has the advantage that it does have a shoulder to it, so that helps a lot. Maybe up a bit here. But the of course that once again I gotta orient it this right and there is quite a bit of slop in this joint. I wish I'd made it a little bit tighter, but I think at least I can get a little bit more here to work with. And I guess once again I guess I could do tape. Not sure which way to go on this. I guess I could just do the super be patient thing and hold on to it for a while, but the problem is it'll sag. And I, and unless I want to wait for 24 hours, I can't compress on this side, and it's not center line anyway, so I guess it might be more tape um, on this guy. So maybe I'll, once again, I'll do my markings for uh, clocking and cut my strips of tape and get this ready to uh, tape and glue. Okay, so I think I got my uh, orientation markings. Once again, it's water activated uh, adhesive. So I will get a towel here all nice and wet. Moist, that be more accurate. Moisturize this guy. I think the big thing here is make certain you definitely don't put too much glue at this point because the uh, channels here are fairly narrow and you don't want to build up a bead of glue in there and restrict the sound wave, the uh, air flow pressure. So dampen this guy up, dampen this guy up. So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna, not going to apply a whole bunch of glue to the inside of this shoulder joint, I'm going to put it on this guy along the outer perimeter so that I'll make certain that I don't put um, it into that uh, kind of a manifolding section there. I don't need a lot. I might be a little more generous than I have been with this. I do got uh, you know quite a bit of a shoulder joint up around the outside edge that I can get it to go into. So here I go. Rotate this in here. Hopefully it will go in there well. I think what I'll do is I'll see if I've got any success. I do. Get that out. last opportunity to see in there. I'll dry the outside a little bit so I don't tape adhesion controls. Talk about tape adhesion, this stuff is like almost annoyingly strong. I guess if you want if you want things to stay put, that's the whole point, but it gets to be kind of fun with your gloves. It really wants to stick to your gloves. Good there. I'm going to put this under, preferably under tension. tension on this side because I got the weight of the horn on the other side, kind of compressing it a little bit. I 
I'm going to pull on the tape while, while I'm pulling on the tape here. That should put the tape under some tension. That my alignment is still good. I'm going to come here. Pretty good. But, yeah, I'm sighting down at various features and just making certain that they look like they're evenly positioned. So so many so much complex geometry that you know I don't know you'd have to really have quite the quite the uh, 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 you know critical eye to be able to spot where it um, if it isn't really perfectly aligned because it, it takes quite a bit of sighting down to see anything. Then the plan is I'm gonna once this is all glued all I'm gonna do the, once again the two part epoxy and I'll probably build up a little bit extra here. I might use some shoe glue or something like that to kind of Put a little extra around these joints. I'm not really sure about butt joints. I would prefer to have had shoulder joints, but we'll see how this goes. This could be. I wish I could compress this more, but I don't know how else I can do it than this. And hopefully, that glue won't expand too much in my manifold area. Unfortunately, I'll never be able to really tell. I was hoping this would be a little more transparent and I could maybe see in there. Not that I could really do anything about it at this point. There's no way I can get down there and do anything, so. What it is is what it'll be, I guess. And the reality is the original, uh, you know, horn adapter thing I'm modeling this after, it in 1922 roughly, it was an aluminum casting, and its uh, horn actually was 90 degrees, so that you could have the party line work for the two molds, and then they had uh, either a sand or perhaps a plaster of Paris um, core, you know, you had to break up. Once it was uh, molded, uh, the, the aluminum had uh, cooled. And so obviously the interior of that would have been pretty rough and textured. So it's kind of questionable how how effective the original even was. And mine, of course, has a bit of texture from being 3D printed, but it's probably nowhere as near as you would think uh, the uh, uh, flashing and uh, the rough texture that a sand or plaster you know, core would, would have left. So, you know, at least from that standpoint, I, I don't think I'm probably doing much worse. So, anyhow, let this guy sit for a while. And, uh, more, more gooey, gunky things to come yet, I'm sure. Well, all glue is dried and it looks really pretty good. I'm very pleased with this. Kind of wishing now I'd maybe gone with a 3D printing colors that might have been, uh, you know, a little more conventional, then I might have just called it good enough, maybe, you know. But I'd like to, um, you know, paint it, fill it, and so forth, so it looks a little bit more like the period thing and not a 3D printed part. But, you know, it's almost to the point where, especially if I'd gone with maybe colors that are a little more reasonable, at least brass down, bronze looking down here also, I might have just called it good enough. But, I'd, you know, I'd like to go that extra little step. So I've got some little bit of sanding here to do. It's... Uh, uh, just to get a little bit of glue off. I don't seem to have a lot of extra glue. I'm really surprised um, how good that came out. So do a little sanding, and then the next thing I got to figure out is um, I got to figure out some a thing to attach here. A block of wood, a piece of metal, or a magnet. And that way, when I do the epoxy work, I, I got something to hold on other than the object itself, and then I can hang it upside down to let the uh, two-part epoxy dry and, and drain and so forth. Another thing is it uh, dawned on me that I had some little fibers inside uh, this thing and from possibly up in here too. And so I very carefully used a heat gun for a few seconds blowing it down up in here and I've, I've melted up, melted off those little little stringy little fibers that once I go to put any epoxy and paint in there, well, obviously that would it would cling to that and really cause some restrictions. As it is in the little fibers probably slow down the airflow a little bit, so I think it's probably worth uh if you're really really careful so obviously it's p l a it wouldn't take hardly anything to do it uh ruin it obviously i I went like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and then take it off and have a look and then maybe do it you know in a few more seconds till it started the wall started feeling warm and it looks like it worked at least for the area that I can see down here with the uh the manifolds together, I'll never know. Of course, I, I was hoping this would be clearer and I could have seen in there. It just, 
it's interesting. I can't even you don't you don't have a depth you don't even have kind of a depth of field. You can't really see the surfaces because they just glow. So the clear plastic, clear-ish plastic didn't really pan out from that standpoint. So do a little sanding, uh, table tape, double side tape, some um, some block of wood and a piece of metal or magnet so I can hang it upside down and have some hand holds so I don't have to touch it. And uh, probably two part epoxy to try and cut down the ripples. Paint, sand, paint, 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 sand. So, yeah, if you folks do any 3D printing and go to the extra effort to uh, do that final finishing uh, stuff, you know, it's uh, quite a bit of labor. Far more labor than, than you know, the modeling and the uh, printing, probably. But the results can be pretty nice. It won't look like quite such an insubstantial plastic thing. And one theory I have is that um, this plastic is porous. If you've ever tried to make a uh, watertight 3D printed object, the water just drains right through the porous plastic parts because they're not really fused together in a truly liquid uh, tight manner, let alone air. So if I seal this with multiple layers of two-part epoxy and, and for sure paint, uh, it might boost its performance a little bit further. Uh, I, I guess the other thought is if I thought about it, I, I could have done a 100% infill and it might have been, made it a little more of a you know solid base so that it can uh, not um, flex and vibrate quite so much with the sound so it might have acoustically been a little bit better if I if I thought about that and if I ever make another one I'll, I'll might uh, try 100% fill and, and maybe a little bit thicker walls and so forth but so far it's looking pretty good okay so I've, I've done all the sanding uh, I think is necessary for the moment and I've taped on the back side some scraps of wood and some magnets. I have a steel plate here and it'll hopefully keep it stable uh, on such a little platform and the biggest thing is I can hold onto this wood as a handle and then I have uh, this is just out of your field of view um, that one really long clamp I had earlier and I have a steel uh, plate here and the idea is the part can then hang from this part from this uh, clamp while it's drying and then uh, drip down and so forth and I can still pick it up and so forth. So that's kind of the idea. I keep my hands from touching this thing. See how much of a disaster of a mess this is going to be. I'm using this um, glaze coat. I bought it at Lowe's. I used it once before for the ear caps. It's kind of an elaborate effort. Um, you pour in equal amounts into two different cups. Then you take and pour the part a into uh, part B and then you mix that for six minutes and then you take that mixed stuff that you've mixed for six minutes and you pour it into a, th uh, a third uh, is it a third cup? I guess it would be a fourth cup, right? Um, uh, anyhow, and you stir it for yet another six minutes until it reaches 90 degrees. And I do have a little IR thermometer, hopefully it'll pick that up this time around. Um, Six minutes or 90 degrees, okay? And then from there, I guess I got a um, really, really short time. I don't know how long. 10 to 15 minutes to mess with the stuff. So it's not the easiest stuff to work with. And I've only used it the one time. And it, it worked pretty well. Um, it's fairly soft and easy to sand is the nice thing. So I'm hoping that I can take rid of a lot of this texture and, and the obvious joints and everything and make it look a little less like a 3D printed part. But we'll see how this goes. So I'll do all the mixing off off camera and then I don't know do I really want to show you how much of an awful mess this is probably going to be on camera I might we'll see anyhow hopefully um, this will pan out okay as much of a mess as I'd like to admit it's uh, all poured on there I poured it into the funnel all around smeared it all around the surfaces flipped it upside down and kind of squeegeed the excess off and as it's been dripping off the edge here, I've been getting on the last little bit as it gets thicker and thicker until it's a nice even coat. And now it's pretty, pretty even everywhere. And I think I've probably gotten to the point where after about a half hour of uh, just some massaging it, I'm just about done here for the evening. And uh, we'll see what it looks like tomorrow. Okay, so the, uh, the two-part epoxy is cured. I think it looks pretty good. Uh, lots of sanding to go and then paint and obviously I really don't need to show that on camera so 
and it'll give you a few updates of each stage of that. But you know, there it is basically. Uh, I'll take it out to the garage and I'll probably set up something similar where I can hang it upside down to paint and then put it on a steel plate I have out there to paint. I'll keep it stable. I'll just look at all the runs and drips off that inevitably still occurred. Smooth it out a little bit of the, some of the rough texture. Paint, 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 sand, paint, 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 sand, and then we'll see what this looks like. Well, quite a few layers of paint and uh, sanding and so forth. I think it came out pretty good. I do need to learn to um, take advantage of if I'm going to use this epoxy, two part epoxy, to sand the, the epoxy down a little bit more and not, um, you know, depend on extra layers of paint to kind of take out the little uh, variations because uh, it, it never seems to work to pour on tons of paint and it just doesn't take the ripples out so there's little flaws but not too bad considering it's four pieces glued together and you know I've never made anything quite this elaborate before the big thing I really recommend is the block of wood with some magnets uh, out in the garage where I was painting I had a, a magnet mounted on a um, kind of a bar I could plop this thing upside down do a bunch of spray painting on it, uh, grab a hold of the thing by the block of wood, write it back down on a steel plate, it'd be stable, spray paint some more, take and grab it by purely the wood block, put it back up, stick it back up on the other plate, paint some more, and so as a result I never had to touch the thing. Now what I have to do is take uh, this tape off and um, you know basically some minor little details of uh, setting up the clips and little things like that and put on some o-rings uh, and um, I think this guy's ready to go okay so after the demo here I'd like to uh, basically just go over the little few little extra features uh, these are the clamping features that can be used for uh, helping to clamp your old headphones on hopefully get a little bit better coupling to the o-ring to the uh, surface of the uh, headphones they, uh, they're left and right, and they have uh, a, a little couple pins and a um, kind of a bushing here that's drilled at a little angle. And those pins, if you print them just right, will press fit in there very nicely. You could also glue them. I have some knobs here. My prototypes are a little big. I'll, I'll make a, a, another version that's a little bit smaller for posting on Thingiverse. It's a long, uh, in my case, 832 screw. You could go with a, obviously, metric or maybe some... Um, whatever size you want I guess. Um, I think the thing to, to remind you of is my uh, head, my uh, speaker is 8% uh, smaller than what I planned it to be because uh, I ran out of space on my uh, printer bed. If I'd realized that the little priming ring rare, uh, priming ring that the, uh, the, the printer does before you actually print was there and it could, I could figure out how to eliminate that I probably could have got 100%. So my headphone, uh, my speaker here is actually 8% smaller. Um, so in my instance my headphones just barely clamp on because they were originally meant for that slightly larger size. Yours will need a piece of foam. I was, I was planning on putting some black foam as it is. Mine will compress right onto the, uh, onto the screws here lightly. So it's just a matter of a, um, I think I'm using a um, Let's see here, it's, I, um, it's a quarter, no it's not a quarter 20, it's a 10, I'm using a 1024 screw, just happen to have a, that length, but a 1024, 1032 screw, that's what, uh, one and a half inches. Okay, I'm going to dig up another couple more screws, who knows what happened to the last pair. Uh, they just, obviously you just tap the bottom side there and screw them on in, lightly. threaded plastic. And you know, as it is, these clamping features are kind of debatable whether or not they're really necessary. The original didn't, most of these originals didn't have it. I think there were some versions that did use like a little sheet metal clamps or clips or something like that. I decided to try this idea. Um, and then an extra feature that the original didn't have, but I think there was at least one version that had kind of a hook built in on the back made this rather kind of lame design. I, I really could come up with something better. It looks like a, uh, I don't know, a uh, cactus, doesn't it? And it's meant to kind of support the headphones. 
You could obviously glue those in permanently if you wanted to. I'm going to let it sit in there at the moment because I'm kind of mixed with it and I don't like them. And uh, it's a little fumbly to get in. But, you know, once you get kind of positioned here. Off the camera here. It only takes obviously a little bit of force and we're in there. And then the headphones are nicely stabilized. Oh, there we go. So now we got headphones that are, you know, they're kind of in there permanently ish. You can leave them there, carry it around, don't have to disturb anything. But once you get the uh, acoustical coupling set just right there, you know, you're basically good to go there. So that's, I guess, the only other real uh, facet to, to uh, be concerned about on, on this design. Obviously, they're not really necessary, but. You know, it does add a little bit to it. Uh, obviously, if I was a little more obsessed, I'd, I'd paint these or something. I'll just call them uh, bronze castings there. I'm good. <laughs> Painting these things are kind of a challenge, and the big part here is what I'm very pleased with. So anyhow, so there's that. And the next thing is to maybe demo um, some modern headphones on this guy and see how they perform. This is a quick demo. Um, Here's some modern uh, Sony uh, headphones to give a try, and uh, obviously they're going to perform quite a bit better. MDR-ZX100. Hook these up and I'll show you how much more performance obviously get from a modern set. And More likely, you know, you're not as likely to have some antique headphones, but you almost certainly have some modest uh, line uh, headphones like this. Well, uh, uh, say the least, it's quite a bit louder, as you would expect from, uh, obviously, modern headphones. And, you know, I suspect these are fairly middling grade themselves, and uh, nothing terribly special. So you can see, um, you know, they definitely, um, yeah, obviously at this high volume, wearing them, it would hurt. <laughs> and uh, even without the uh, speaker horn, you obviously could hear quite a bit more sound, but still, the, the sound amplification is very noticeable for these guys. So if anything at all, you know, even if you don't have um, antique headphones, you know, you can have fun with some modern ones. One of the thoughts is to get uh, a couple Bluetooth headphones rewire them so that one headphone set um, has one channel and the other headphone set has the other channel and then somehow figure out how to do two Bluetooth receivers and I'm not sure how they'd be done but and then build two speaker horns and you have stereo. It'd be kind of a fun project. I keep toying with the idea of any of that. I do have another set of headphones right here that are Bluetooth and it only costs like 15 bucks and their performance is I think even better than these. So it'd be kind of a fun thing, you know, maybe you just glue them in permanently and Make, it a, make them just a permanent set. It's one of those thoughts. Maybe somebody out there might build a couple of these and give it a try. It'd be kind of a fun 
um, little project that had stereo Bluetooth uh, speakers uh, from the 1920s. <laughs> You know, overall, I'd have to say that's pretty decent performance, actually. Anyhow, thanks for watching.